Hello everyone, you welcome to The Inside on Equinox Television. I am Babla Jonathan. In this edition of the program, we're going to be taking a look at recent happenings in the two Anglophone regions of the Republic of Cameroon, the Northwest and the Southwest regions, as far as the Anglophone crisis is concerned with the situation that has continued deepening on the ground. We equally take a look at the court case between the former Advocate General at the Supreme Court of Cameroon and the State of Cameroon. And and we also look at the happenings in the popular action a party which our guest leads. Stay with us. Our guest in this edition of the program is a retired advocate general at the Supreme Court of the Republic of Cameroon. He is a former member of Cameroon's lower house of parliament. He is the president, the national president of the Popular Action Party, the PAP, Justice Aya Paula Bini. You're welcome to the program. Thank you very much, uh, Jonathan. You're one of the people who have been vocal, uh, speaking with very strong terms as far as the Anglophone crisis is concerned. Did you see what is happening in the northwest and southwest regions of the country uh, today? Did you see it coming? The new twist with bloodshed, killings, destruction of properties, abductions. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for the question. I must say that from the moment I entered Parliament in 2002, my main goal was nation building. I remember a journalist asking me, why almost everything I said was on nation building, whereas there is the adage that charity begins at home. I saw this coming even before I entered parliament. As a judge, I came out with decisions, judgments, I should say, saying that the non-observance of the bilingual nature of the country was moving us towards the abyss of disaster. In Parliament, the first ever point I raised in Parliament, to the embarrassment of my party, at that time I was on the CPDM ticket, was the fact that the bill was brought before Parliament, which was not translated properly into English. And I saw the way Anglophones were treated in the country as if they were conquered people and I was very vocal saying that we're moving towards a catastrophe because if we take just my example I could not be a super scale judge group one index 1400 that's the highest in the anglophone public service you make me a deputy to the Procureur General, who is junior to me in age, at least. And then you go ahead and put between him and me a Francophone, who is also a super scale magistrate, but group two, on index 1115. So I saw that the marginal. marginal marginalization of Anglophone was moving us towards the precipice. And it has brought As us where, where we are today. Indeed. And, and when you look at what is happening today in the northwest and the southwest uh, regions of the country, do you see uh, any solution coming soon? How do you feel about the situation? Uh, all along, I was for dialogue. In my political manifesto, I stood for a 10-state federation. Now I've gotten to a point where to talk of a federation even plunges you in trouble. Because people have been rad radicalized to a point where talking about a federation looks like you know, you're selling out. What is the possible solution? 
it is for our leaders to come back to their senses i want to stand on that phrase coming back to their senses to know that might is not always right to know that when you dialogue the first thing is you give your opponent the impression that you are about a solution you are looking for a solution that automatically dissipates passions now the only thing I see which can maybe temper a little the explosive situation today where entire villages are burnt down crops on the farms are chopped down is for the government to declare a unilateral ceasefire and some have qualified what, what you what you describe as explosive some have qualified it as civil war in the in the country but how else, what is happening how else can it be described the president of the republic declared war to the hearing of the entire world how can you declare war and it is called otherwise and if you declare war on a part of your country it is a civil war so we are in a war situation the belligerent power is those who are in authority it is for them to take the first step by de de declaring a unilateral truce thereafter the government should facilitate a meeting of the anglophones both in the country and in the diaspora so that they agree on exactly what they want and that point will be taken to taken to the table perhaps not longer no longer for dialogue because passions have been so exacerbated that we can only talk about negotiations now we go to the negotiating table and talk about the future of our living together the future of our peaceful coexistence and the situation has continued deepening to the extent that a, a man of god a priest is kidnapped and his whereabouts remains unknown as we talk I just talked about the fact that I stood for a 10 state federation. If I were to make such a pronouncement now, I would be a target tomorrow. You see, in a situation like this, what is most dangerous is the fact that there is no benevolent neutrality. However much you try, either the government accuses you of belonging or supporting the other side or vice versa. So the priests who are in a position of moral authority are simply targeted because they are preaching peace the government government looks at them as if they are against their war effort and the other people look at them as if they are selling them to the government that's where we are today so that everybody in Cameroon including you and me today are targets anything can happen to us in addition to that what is most disturbing is the fact that people are settling private scores in the name of the conflict, in the name of the war. If, for instance, a uniformed person gets into your house, takes away your laptop, takes away your television set, as I'm here, that's my television set there. For me to look for the receipt, it could take me a week because I have a box of receipts from 19 maybe 65 to trace one can take me a month but he comes in in the name of prosecuting a war and loots your house takes away your property you see that is private scores now so we've gotten to a point where even the religious people are not spared and until the government sees reason to stop all this by taking the first step towards peace <laughs> we are moving towards a disaster, a catastrophe. Some people would even call it, call it cataclysm. Your party is also calling for the release of those who are in jail. I can tell you here and now that more than 90% of those in jail are innocent people. They meet you anywhere and pick you up. They break into your house and pick you up. 
They meet you in the market and pick you up. Some people are picked up for simply not being in possession of their identity cards. And they're kept for one year, eight months. Whereas the maximum punishment for not presenting an identity card on demand is 10 days. But they're kept for one year, six months, 18 months. So some of those people know nothing. They have no connection with whatever is going on. They are simply victims. In fact, they are like scapegoats. Now, some of them have been uh, judged and sentenced already, some to 11, some to 12, some to 13 years in jail with fines added to the different prison terms, while others, like uh, one of the prominent detainees of the Young Reform Crisis, Mancho BBC, is still waiting his final verdict, even though he has already been declared guilty of terrorism, uh, revolution, and of course cessation and acquitted of other charges. Uh, what's your opinion about the way this case has been handled by the judicial system, the case of the Anglophone detainees? You see me almost you know, smiling in a situation like this one, which is a situation of extreme sadness. It is because, first of all, the military court has no jurisdiction over civilians. All over the world, they call military courts court marshals. They try only members of the security, members of the armed forces. They don't try civilians. That's the first point. The second point is that because they are under strict discipline, they can never do justice. In fact, I'm not questioning their knowledge of the law, but they cannot apply the law as it ought to be applied. When they pick up any Anglophone, he does not have an identity card. The next thing is secession, uh, complicité, uh, hostilité à l'État. It is stereotyped. Whereas Section 164 of the Criminal Procedure Code requires that you tell a person, Jonathan, on Susu -su Day, at Susu -su -su Place, you did Susu -su -su Act, contrary to law, Susu -su -su -su, Article Susu -su -su. That's how a person is charged in accordance with, with the Criminal Procedure Code in force in Cameroon. But as I've said, once you get to the brigade or wherever they take you to, you only hear recitation, uh, hostility à l'état, secession, uh, complicité. Th that is all. Those people are just branded. You see, they label them with anything they like. And the court uses military methods to find them guilty. In fact, to say find them guilty is even uh, being kind. Just condemn them. If, for instance, the President of the Republic says the people he calls secessionists must be punished, he has already found them guilty. Sending them to the military court is in superfluity. And therefore, there is no procedure before those military courts. And the cases have been postponed Just adjourned because there is no evidence adjourned against several them. Times. And because there's no evidence against them, instead of taking a quick decision at least to expedite justice, they keep them and keep them. I've never heard that in one charge where there are a number of people, they find some of them guilty today. The next day they find some of them guilty again. The next day they find in one charge. You prove a charge and there is the same evidence. So what justification would anybody have to take in a group of maybe 10, you take three and find them guilty and convict the next day? On the same trial, the same witnesses have given evidence. And it's never done like that anywhere to the best of my knowledge. And I think I was in the judiciary for almost 40 years. And I had occasion to read 
a lot of jurisprudence, cases decided you know, under common law, cases decided under civil law, cases decided in Cameroon and so on. Why I've never so? seen that. Why is it so? Why is it that the judiciary, uh, according to what you're saying now, is not doing its job properly as far as this case is concerned, this case of the detainees of the Anglophone crisis and of course many other cases that we've not mentioned here? I've told you and is I'm... Is the problem with the judges? Is the problem with uh, the... the the judicial system. I've itself. told you and I'm repeating that the President of the Republic, who is the Commander-in-Chief of the Armed Forces, who is the first magistrate, as I hear people call him, and the law makes it that way because he's the head of the Judicial Council, has already said those people are guilty. They have to be punished. Elsewhere, the head of state would say they have to be brought to justice. But here he pronounces their guilt before they are taken to court. So what do you expect the courts to do? You need somebody fearless, somebody with good knowledge of the law, to be able to apply the law by departing from the conviction already pronounced by the head of, let me call it head of state, head of whatever. Justice Ayapol Abine is the judiciary in Cameroon under the yoke of the executive arm? I don't know, we may call it judiciary by you know, misnomer, just for the sake of calling it judiciary. Take my case, for instance. The habeas corpus I filed in the high court of uh, Fundi, Fundi, whatever. The law gave them a number of days to come out with a judgment. They took double that time. We went to the court of appeal. The number, the, 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 the length of time the court gave them to take a decision was doubled. I went to the Supreme Court where I was a member. A member of the Supreme Court, the highest you know, court in the land. The law gave them one month, 30 days, to be precise, 30 days to decide my case. I went on an appeal in May, that's 2017. We are now in May 2018, one year after they've not taken a decision. And you call it judiciary? We'll be coming back to that in greater details in the later part of the, the program. Uh, I want to know, is the executive arm of the state, I mean the, the government, the president of the republic in particular influencing the judiciary that is a thing that everybody knows except you want me to repeat look around the world especially in the common law world where the president of the republic is going out of the country the president of the supreme court is expected to go to the airport to see him off the attorney general of the country goes to the airport to see him off. When he's coming, whatever work they are doing, they suspend a court session to go and receive him. How else can somebody be more subservient than that? So they are serving the, the head of state, that's what you're saying? Very, very subservient. And they you, take orders. And, and you were part of that uh, judicial system during your, 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 your passage in very true in the judicial system that's it you were also functioning like that mm, i am not here to judge myself but the least i can say is that if any judge that has been in cameroon who stood his ground fearlessly it was paul Aya. i took judge I came out with judgments saying that the sima code or hada were not applicable to cameroon because cameroon was bilingual and they were monolingual i came out with judgments saying that the, the state was wrong in this or that you know case then boldly in fact courageously maybe i made an impact but on the whole the cameroon Cameroonian judiciary is at the beck and call of the executive. We may have some sympathy for them, have some compassion for them, because 
the president of the republic appoints them he transfers them he promotes them so for those who instead of leading and serving the people for those of them who depend on promotions on staying in towns instead of going to the rural areas they just remain subservient they are just like you know, a dog following you know the master if the master say if the dog strays a little say the dog comes back to order that's how i look at our judiciary sorry to say so but the truth must be spoken if things are to be corrected in the light of what you're saying is the case of the anglophone detainees you know detainees of the anglophone crisis being manipulated from the top from the presidency of the republic for example well you are asking uh, the same question in different ways I've already told you that if the head of the judiciary, the head of the armed forces, says that, I mean, passes a judgment, because by saying the people must be punished, it means they're already wrong. They are, he's you know, proven them wrong. He has already convicted them. What can the lower people here do, especially in the army, where they take orders from above? He is the commander-in-chief, and the commander-in-chief says this person is guilty. You expect somebody under him to hold otherwise in what way? Right. We're going to take a short break time for us to look at the situation, the deplorable situation of thousands of Cameroonians who are now seeking refuge in neighboring Nigeria. As a result of the Anglophone crisis, many of them fled their villages in the southwest and in the northwest regions because of a rising violence and confrontations between armed civilians on one hand and security and defense forces on the other hand. And they are now seeking refuge in Nigeria, living in deplorable conditions in refugee camps. We have been suffering, people have been dying, even children have been dying. Sick, sick the body with plenty. Death, sickness, pains, sorrow, hardship, eating deep into the marrows of tens of thousands of Cameroonians seeking refuge in Nigeria. Violence, killings, destruction of properties, indiscriminate arrest forced them out of their houses and villages in the crisis-stricken southwest and northwest regions of Cameroon. They are now suffering and dying in a foreign land. Their livelihood depends on humanitarian gestures of men and women of goodwill and non-governmental organizations like the Aya Foundation. On rare days like this, when they are visited by humanitarians, there is scrambling.
men, women, children, Cameroonians scrambling to survive, scrambling for food out of a country described as the land of plenty, the breadbasket of the Central African sub-region, their fatherland. <laughs> Besides food, clothes and shoes constitute another cause for scrambling. To show just how desperate they have become, this scramble sometimes turns violent and difficult to contain. We came to visit the refugees from Cameroon that are here in Cross River State. We've been going through Cross River State, so these are the three we're at Amana to visit Cameroonian refugees that have been completely abandoned by their government and their politicians to die in Nigeria. So we would think differently from them. We've come to visit them to give them some assistance, some help. We do that every month. Give them some assistance, give them some basics, food, financial assistance to keep them going until the crisis will be resolved. So that's why we came here. We've met a lot of issues here. We've met newborn babies that are refugees in Nigeria. We've met sick people, we've met lame people, we've met people in very, very, very bad shape. You see the images. So we are hoping that uh, very soon we'll resolve the crisis and that our people will go back to Cameroon. Home is home. And the number of Cameroonian refugees in Nigeria has continued to increase as the young phone crisis deepens. The UN talks of 20,000 plus registered children and women. But I can authoritatively say they are plus 50,000 across four main states. Cross River State, Benue State, Taraba State and Akwaibom State. Plus 50,000. There are stretches in Lagos and Abuja, people who are just fed up of the whole thing and they just believe they just have to find, they just have to integrate themselves in Nigeria. So there are some patches across Abuja, Lagos. I even received a, a call from Inugu that there are some people there who were badly, they're in very bad shape, shot by the military. So our people are there, sleeping on the floor. Our girls are prostituting. I met some in Benue State. There are two, particularly, I got your telephone numbers. I have to go back there and look for them and give them something to at least help them get a better life out of themselves. Our kids have water. Even water is a luxury, but they have water for lunch. They get water from the river courses. They come in Ecom, for example. We use the word camp. It's not really a camp. It's, they're just buildings that the Nigerian government has given to our people, uncompleted buildings. The Nigerian government has been very kind. So in a small patch of maybe two meters or three meters square, you have kids, you have children, there's a difference between kids and children. You have the age, you have parents and grandparents living together. So you have the really terrible education that the young and the very young are getting, sharing those spaces with very, with experiences that are beyond your ages by the grown-ups, for example, smoking cigarettes, and it is terrible. One of the scenes that really touched me when I was there was that of my kid, two years of age, two and a half, eating with his brother 
And at a certain point, he seizes the plate of food. When I say food, it's just some barley cooked rice. Food is an overstatement. He seizes the plate of fried rice, and his brother is running towards him, and he wants his brother and tells him that no, he's only his is enough. So he's about survival of the fetus. There is no food. Food is a luxury. So whenever somebody comes, an angel from heaven, you can see a grandparent and a daughter-in-law fighting for a sachet of oil, just about 150 francs here. You can see a grandmom cursing her granddaughter for refusing to share a cup of rice with her. That's how our people are living there. And they are dying by the day. Many of them are now asking, where is our government? Are we still Cameroonians? As to wait for that day when the crisis will be over so they can return home. You welcome back. Justice Ayapol Abini, what's your take on the situation of these refugees who are in Nigeria? The situation is deplorable. When we're in the dry season, the people were in heaven because they, 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 they stay in the open air, they lie on the verandas of people who are who allow them to they sleep in classrooms in the daytime when schools are you know on they stay wherever they can find a shed at night they come into the classrooms you know what it means for you to get up in the morning you don't know whether you're going to have breakfast or not you don't know if somebody is going to be benevolent enough to give you something to eat. That's how those people are. And you can imagine the situation of children. They got up in the morning, they want to eat. They don't care, they know nothing about refugee camps. They know that they are no longer in their houses, but they have to eat. And imagine, they can go for days without even water. I see people making a lot of wonderful comments on, on the walls, on, on the internet. But if they knew what is really happening to those people out there, I mean, they will share their widow's might with the people. Not to talk of those who are in the forests. They are fighting against snakes. With the rainy season, and the wind, storm, a branch of any tree can fall on them at any time and kill them. They are in the rain. It's a disaster. I mean, it's a disaster. If you know the true situation, you cry any time you think about what's happening to those people. Not to talk of those who are wounded. How do you treat them? The pregnant women who have a situation in a manner where one of them gave, gave birth to you know, uh, triplets. She doesn't even know where the husband is. And many of them have died already. She cannot fend for herself. Then she has to add three mouths. You know. For now we have not heard about the fate of those children since we last went there but uh, we just hope they are still alive that's what's happening old people they're blind the lame they're just there waiting for manna from heaven or death and the government has been practically silent I read on the internet people saying that those are not Cameroonians. They can die, they are Biafrans, they've only gone back home. And some of those things are said by fellow Anglophones saying that of their own people. Not to talk of the government. 
If they can even remain there and die, maybe Cameroon will see peace. You know what it means for somebody born in the image and likeness of God like yourself, who is maybe three, 2,000 kilometers away from you, telling you that that is his land and that you should go back to wherever you came from. That, that person is more than God who sent you to be born at that place. He's in his own home, 2,000 kilometers away. I've read that on the internet. The government has remained silent. That is in either connivance or encouragement. All right, now we're going to take a look at the case, the court case between uh, you, Justice Ayabola Bini, retired Advocate General at the Supreme Court of uh, Cameroon and the state. Uh, we filed two cases abroad. One was filed in my personal name when I was still in captivity. As I could not get justice done in Cameroon, I went to Geneva and filed a petition before the United Nations uh, human rights uh, team there. That one we're still waiting for action. And then one of the legal secretaries of uh, our political party, PAP, um, took a list of uh, victims with me, of course, at the forefront, victims of the party that were, I mean, abducted, uh, arrested, injured, and so on, to the African Commission on Human and People's Rights at Banjul. Uh, about a week ago, in fact, on the 21st of last month, April, uh, they sent us a document saying that the case is admissible that the case is properly before them and that um, they find that there's a prima facie case that there's evidence showing that things against the law have been perpetrated by the Cameroon government against the 18 of us who've taken the action to them and that uh, we have two months to file evidence which I personally call additional evidence Additional evidence in the sense that they cannot say there's a prima facie case when there's no evidence. So we have two months to file additional evidence and uh, thereafter they'll call on the government to answer. Mm -hmm. We are claiming damages in the sum of 100 billions against the state of Cameroon before the court, before the commission in, in Banjul, Gambia. Uh, and what has the court said so far, the, the commission in Banjul, so far about these uh, damages you're claiming? No, as I've said, they want us to prove, I mean, to give them evidence on which they can work and calculate the damages if they find Cameroon liable. So as of now, they cannot say anything. They just want us to give, furnish them with more evidence. For instance, as I'm sitting here, do you see me exuberant and radiant? But I don't see with this eye. Some people who is keen, I mean who are keen, would even see that at times when I want to look at you, I turn almost completely round because I don't see with this. I see only with one eye now. This eye is damaged at more than 90%. So we have to give them evidence of what we went through, the damage to our persons, the damage to our estate, and so on. So we are working on that. Um, and luckily, we have formed a team which is collecting evidence for us. And what you were just explaining now concerning uh, one of your eyes is just one of the uh, result of what you went through. Of course. Before then, it's true I was using eyeglasses for reading, but I had no problem with my eye. Mm -hmm. It's because of the conditions under which I was kept for the first two days that I suffered a cardiac you know, attack and then my eye, whatever chemicals we used in that you know, cell, let me call it cell, 
We don't know. But if I stayed there for three days, <laughs> you would only be talking to a corpse now. If you can talk to a corpse. Luckily, the colonel who was in charge at the time, I believe he's still there, was quite reasonable. And when he saw me on the Monday after my arrest on Saturday, he, he, he was shocked. And uh, I asked him to look at me and tell me if that's how I was two days earlier. And he arranged a, a separate place for me where I stayed for the rest of my time there for, in fact, 221 days. The first two days in that cell where I suffered the damage. You can see me, as I've said, exuberant and radiant as I am. But a cardiac attack can come at any time. So I suffered a cardiac attack there on at least two occasions. And from time to time, I still feel congested in the chest. I've never been a man of medicines, be the medical or native. But now I take a minimum of eight tablets every morning. Then eye drops, which are not helping me very much. Now he's into a legal battle with the state of Cameroon. How far do you intend to go? No, we have to go to the end. I know that uh, every court has the jurisdiction, has the power to settle a matter amicably, as settlement out of court. But it takes the initiative of the defendant for an amicable settlement to be struck. Outside an amicable settlement, we go on until the court gives a final you know, judgment. And it must be understood that in those courts, there's no room for appeal. Um, as I appeal properly speaking. Knowing, the, ha, knowing how things uh, function in this country, do you see what you're requesting? 100 billion francs of damages coming that easy? No, it's not uh, for the party, the complainant, the plaintiff to determine. It is the court which will look at all the evidence, the suffering of the people. Uh, one of uh, the petitioners, one of the plaintiffs, to put it that way, was picked up here and through torture he has lost it too. I'm talking of Ngalim Felix. The man who received me at Dallas Airport in Washington in 2011. So they will look at all the evidence. I, I, in fact, for the first time, I went in for a loan, cleared a portion of land of upwards of 20 hectares to plant you know, rubber, rubber. And I got some company in Cameroon here to prepare me 5,000 seedlings, boarded. You know, some people would say grafted. 5,000. Because of my, det and I had a child trained to plant and take care. Because of my captivity, I lost all that. So when all that evidence produced before the court, the court would determine what is adequate compensation. They can never really give back my eye, but the court would determine what is adequate compensation for my losing an eye. So it's not for us to determine. And you say, knowing about realities here, it's not Cameroon deciding the case. It's an international body. We, we know how um, sometimes we have stood against even pressure coming from outside, not to talk of local uh, institutions or you know human rights bodies that have been speaking and it's like throwing water on the decks back. No, that is just short-lived. I can tell you as I'm sitting here that in the next 200 years, Cameroon will be paying for the damage caused to this country in the last 30 years. Nobody will, should imagine is going to be there forever. And then there are avenues, international avenues, open to us to enforce 
no, the judgment. Cameroon is not independent. There is no country in the world that is completely independent of the rest of the world. They have embassies. Their planes go to foreign lands. Their ships. They trade with foreign you know, uh, uh, governments. So there are many ways we can enforce our judgment. Not necessarily locally. And there are international bodies that can do that for us. Okay, we're going to take a look at what the newspapers reported this week. Sman Jikan Gebre with the press review. The Anglophone crisis, deliberations at Cameroon's upper house and issues relating to the upcoming presidential elections covered front pages of major newspapers this week. On the Anglophone crisis, the median reported that insecurity in Iluani, Boa, Tombel keeps 2,000 jobs at risk at CDC. While the same median also said that Pusin Amber fighters, soldiers descended on Muyenge, Bafia, Bali, Nyasoso, and Azi. The star captions as the Anglophone crisis turns ugly, Bia orders PM Mosonge's commission to tour regions. This is coming at a time, the star says, that ruthless attacks hit the Catholic Church in the Northwest region. The horizon on its part says, as brutality and harassment of civilians by army continues, Northwest Governor is at odd with Minat Boss as he calls on the military to build new relationship with population. The Sun newspaper reports that it was another week of killings, kidnappings and burnings in the Northwest and Southwest regions as unrest continues with the arrest of the principal of St. Beat. A story the Guardian Post also reported alongside the Voice and Eden newspaper. The release of Reverend Father Williams Niba also made news with the Eden and the Post Weekender reporting the story. The Eden says kidnaps and beats principal Father Williams Niba released, while the Guardian Post said kidnapped St. Beats College principal freed. Meanwhile, in the upper house, the Guardian Post and the Post Weekender reported about the accumulation of functions that caused an outcry for the opposition senators. The Guardian Post says for Mukete, three others dump board chair positions for Senate and the Post Weekender added that Mukete, 15 others dumb board chair post for Senate. About the upcoming presidential elections, The Sun and The Post Weekender reported on OC's introduction to the population of the West region. OC cautions Cameroonians, don't enslave yourselves for another seven years. The Sun captioned it as OC flags up a to the conquest in Buddha. That was Smart Njikan Gibri with the press review. Coming up next, interviews of the week. When I got up at 4.30 today and went up for, for math at around 5.30. When we finished our, our morning prayers, finished praying the sound, it was already time for math. When it was ready when it was time for us to sing the Lord have mercy as the as the head of the school choir in between the song. Suddenly as as we were trying as we started singing, some group of boys just entered. The other one jumped at the altar and and he sit since there were two since pa, two um fathers on the altar, the the men assist the main servant of the mass which was not the principal. So after so after that they brought the so after that they brought back the chaplain and the and went and the came and took the principal along with them. So I don't know what happened next. I'm uh, appealing to all the Norwegians now to rally like one man for 
all of us to fight again the global insecurity in the region and uh, allow the economic situation of the region comes back to normalcy. The crisis is affecting us because business is not booming. They say the best thing, the best way in this life is the hardest way. So I advise any young man out there, if they don't want to hustle, they will not enjoy Cameroon. As for me, I'm hustling. We have been trained for three years and it is the law. This exam is supposed to have been launched after two years. We have exceeded two years and done even three. We wrote the exams with confidence and we are very sure that we passed. We can't see her names of students who have never been trainees, who were never people advocates, have become lawyers today, while some of us who have trained night and night to become are not there. We want our marks to be published. This is an exam, it is not a concour. And the law organizing these buses, once you have 12 and above, you have passed. <music> The second federal treatment given journalists by politicians, administrators, or the part that be can even cause the most patient dog to wake from slumber, especially when one considers the long years and resources wasted or vested to acquire education like the rest of the professions that are being held. Journalists, especially those of the private press, are being viewed as beggars who run after leftovers. Hooligans, terrorists, mock rakers, or subversive elements who have lost their dignity in a profession of nobility. The public press, on the other hand, is being viewed by the masses as accomplices of the repressive status quo. In the course of uh, our activities in 2017 and early uh, 2018, we have been uh, at the forefront to secure the release of our colleagues of our English speaking education. And we saw the release of six of them. Some others are still detained and some are on the run. We wrote to the head of state on May the 2nd asking for presidential clemency for BBC Manchu and Howard Thomas. We said that whatever they, they have done, whatever may be uh, the cause of their arrest, whatever is the cause of uh, the judicial action that is taken against them, we are asking the head of state to protect those two journalists because they are sons of Cameroon. Press freedom in Cameroon, the situation today is uh, not really good because press freedom will have to go with uh, financial independence as concerns of the press. Journalists today in Cameroon, they are not always, they don't have that financial strength to like carry out good investigative reports. This is because media houses in Cameroon, they give very small or meager salary to journalists, so they're not really free to exercise their function financial-wise. Now, the second thing is access to information. They cannot be press freedom when getting information in the country is still a problem. Today you have government officials and the other politicians and uh, businessmen. You cannot independently carry out an investigative report because they will always place barriers along the way that can uh, force a journalist uh, to withdraw and give up the process in the course of investigating. We do have a lot of challenges, putting in mind that we African, we are in the third world country and what we call developing country. So if we are developing country, it means we have the problem also in, into the infrastructure. Our infrastructure are not very friendly. As we are now embarking to the digital activities and going to the paperless. So this, this system, sometimes they are failing and we are not very much used. And even the people who are operating the system, sometimes they are not very competent enough. And also, we in Africa, we have a lot of power cut. So once the power is off, then you cannot operate. And third, also the roads which, are, which we are using to transport our cargo, also they are not good.
told you earlier that our guest in this edition of the program is the national president of the Popular Action Party. It was first the People's Action Party and the name was later changed to Popular Action Party. Justice Ayapola Bini, why the change of name? What happened? Uh, we just met um, February 2016, February 27th, and uh, people were of opinion that when you say popular, it has double significance than when it's just a people. So it was better for us to change to popular and you know, gain more popularity, get it more easily understood by the people than if you say people. So we changed the, the name uh, in February 2016 and uh, we notified the authorities as required by law. So today we have Popular Action Party. Are you against um, leaders, African leaders, who cling to power for several decades? Absolutely. Absolutely. China was a no-go area for decades. It took a certain Nixon to open you know, the way to China. If he wasn't president, maybe even as we're talking now, China would still be a no-go area. And when you don't go to a person to know how he is, to know his plans, it is most dangerous. So it is only normal that we should have change of leadership from time to time. When I came out with a manifesto, as manifesto for PAP in 2011, actually we started in 2010, we said a president in Cameroon should not be in power for more than two terms of five years each, maximum ten years. But you have been the president of uh, what was first of all the People's Action uh, Party and now the Popular Action Party. Uh, you've been the president of that political party for, for so long? Uh, no, not really as people imagine. I joined the PAP when I when resigned left, from, when, uh, when I resigned from CPDM in 2010. That's when I joined PAP. In fact, properly speaking, I joined PAP in January 2011. 2011 to 2018 is not even up to the 10 years we're talking about. And if I am still head of the PAP, it is simply because I have said this in many avenues. I fund the party at, at least 90%. If I left PAP today, PAP would go back to where it was. I don't know how many people heard about PAP before I joined it. Let me tell you a small anecdote. Two people formed PAP, John Dane and Paul Ayer, when I was president of Court of First Instance in Boya. John Dane was working with Radio Boya. We formed it and then invited Mr. Ngo to register since we were civil servants. He was a lawyer. We invited him to register because we couldn't be at the forefront. So PAP has been there since it was registered in 91. This, we formed it in 90, but it was ef effectively registered in 91, April 26. Nobody heard about PAP until I got in. So a good many people you know, have you know, intimated that I should stay on for a while and get it grounded. And others thought that you should leave the presidency of the party? Well, a handful, I think there were three people, you know, if you have a party and three people hold otherwise, I thought that we are in democracy and uh, the majority, you know, carries the vote. I can tell you, even as you are sitting before me here, that I am not very enthusiastic about active politics right now. If I look at the way people are suffering, Anglophones in particular, in the bushes, in foreign lands, 
I think that God is calling me elsewhere. And that's why I've started admitting some Anglophone orphans into my orphanage. Incidentally, that orphanage has been in existence since 9th January 1989. We're celebrating our 30th anniversary in January next year. So I'm taking them into the orphanage. That's where my attention now is more focused than in anything else, not even active politics. But, but you continue to keep your position as president of the PAP. Let me tell you that the government, the, uh, Mr. Bia's government as of now, fears just one party, the PAP. Because if not succeeded in su you know, subjugating us, in bribing us, so the present fight is Are against you that the other opposition political parties many many whatever they say in public just nonsense i don't want to you know, say more than that for now if you look at what's going on now government cannot justify why after publishing for five six seven years that there was need for us to have national reconciliation in Cameroon. There's need for dialogue. I talked, I published at least eight posts on the need for dialogue. Why was I captured and put in captivity? 223 days. As I'm talking now, my secretary, you know, fled the country. They arrested the brother and he's in detention right now. now I mean, since he was arrested last year, He's not been be before any court, and that's a civil servant. The father is on the run. They arrested the sister. My campaign manager is on the run. When he left, they arrested the wife with their you know, two weeks old child and detained them for four days. When she was released on bail, they kept her identity card. She had to flee the country and join the husband wherever they are now. They are running after my officials, even as we are talking. Aban was detained first for 43 days in the name of whatever against SCNC. Aban was our national coordinator. Then they the arrested him again, took to Yaoundé. Yes, the national coordinator of PAP. Took him to Yaoundé, kept him there, then took him overnight to Buya and kept him for... How many months until he was released? I don't want to go into details. Last month or so. So they are fighting PAP in all ways. Our organizing secretary. How is the PAP a threat to the Yaoundé administration or the BIA regime? Because we refuse to be influenced, to be compromised. And we tell them the truth. Not everybody would be detained for 223 days and would say the things I am saying here. We tell them the truth. And there's no reason why we should not tell people the truth. And that is the fear. When, for instance, I came out condemning the fact that the Secretary General in the presidency is on 2.5 million a day, every day, including Sunday and public holiday. Every day has 2.5 million for fuel. He has how many jetliners? Only we can say that. In the history of the Parliament of Cameroon, who did what I did? I analyzed all those things. And I'm saying those things even now, without fear of favor. So that's why PAP is a threat. Because we tell them the truth. We tell them, how do you explain that a Cameroonian woman is looking for five francs to buy my ghee cube to sweeten her soup? But there's somebody who doesn't even live here on there, who is on 2.5 million a day for fuel. How do you explain that? So we tell them the truth, and we propose to continue to tell them the truth. Justice Aya Paul Abini, this is an electoral year, and the presidential election is expected to be organized this year. As the national president of the Popular Action Party, are you looking forward to seize power from President Paul Beer? You see, when I see some people declaring their candidacies, most often I just laugh. You cannot be a candidate without a political base. PAP, the 
two, I mean, three strongholds of PAP were Manu, Le Bialem, Kopem, and Nguba. Those are the battlefields. When I say they are fighting essentially PAP, those who, uh, so how do you present your candidacy? You go and tell somebody who is hungry, somebody who is in the rain, in the bush, he can be killed by a snake at any time. You go and tell him, please vote for me. I doubt whether there's anybody who has a conscience as an Anglophone today in Cameroon that anybody with a conscience can declare his candidacy. Without a political base. Not even if you had a political base and the people are not there, as I've given you the example of PAP, how do you go in for election? To me, it is an aberration. Are you not only presidential election. Are you referring to Barista Ben Mono? No, no, I have nobody in mind. I'm just saying that a true Anglophone, those who are candidates know themselves, no true Anglophone in Cameroon today can seeing the present state of affairs where people are being burnt alive in their houses entire villages are burnt down crops on the farms are chopped down that you can go and stand an election in circumstances like this if you have a conscience if you have human feelings you know that all those people are made in the same image and likeness of God like yourself? No. I mean, it's facetious. Completely. It's a joke. It's a joke. So the PAP will not uh, be part of the presidential, the legislative, the municipal, and perhaps the regional elections? If we were not in democracy, where Aya has only one vote, and that I can be overruled by the other members of the national executive of PAP, national officials. Let me not say executive, some other person may. If I am not overruled, if it were I are taking the decisions, those things are ruled out Elections. for this year. I am working with the IA Foundation. You needed to see how the foot of that man from Munyenge, you know, was rotting away until he was amputated. I mean, you see a situation like that and you tell such a person to give you a vote so that you are whatever. Uh, how serious are we? But, but some would say that you need to take over power in order to be able to properly handle these issues that you're talking about. I have said before that I can never accede to power over a drop of you know, blood of any single human being. I'd never do that. And the blood is being spilled now by the day. People are being killed in their tents. I would not prosecute for power over you know, spilled blood. I never can do that. No. How will the change that you seem to be uh, preaching come about? How will um, things uh, change in this country if you, you are not going for elections? When I came out with my... Are you, are you joining those who are uh, calling on Cameroonians to rise up and cease power, not necessarily through violence, but cease power, uh, ask the Bia regime to step down? When I came out with uh, my political manifesto, one of the essential things I said there was that Cameroon needed a Truth and Reconciliation Commission as it was like the one in South Africa. We need a Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Where we are today, I've already told you and I'm only repeating, the government should come back to its senses, to the right senses, declare a unilateral truce, and let us sit at the table and talk. Talk our 
maybe coexistence, talk about peace, establish peace, then can we talk about election? As it is now, election can only hold in the usual way, where whether people vote or not, people have 200 percent. They can only hold that way, but if things were to be properly done, let us first of all re-establish peace. Bring back the voters from foreign lands, from the forest. Then express regret for the dead. See what we can do for the maimed. See what we can do for those rendered homeless through arson, official arson. Then can we start thinking about election? Gabon postponed election for two years. There was no war in Gabon. They just organized a national meeting to you know, set new standards of conducting official business. Here there is war. Let the war come to an end before we think about something else. That is what is urgent. But some uh, politicians are against uh, the opinion that the Yaoundé administration should use the pretext of the current socio-political impasse in the two Anglophone regions of the country as a reason to postpone elections. I've already said it is selfishness. It is selfishness. I would write that word if, you, if I was writing in capital letters. Selfishness. As I've said before, how does a candidate go to Manfred today and tell the houses that have not been burnt down to vote for him? How does a candidate go to Le Bialem right now and campaign? Postponing election is only logical for us to have peace and organize free fair and transparent election. Anybody holding to the contrary is doing that out of selfishness, nothing else. All right. Keeping aside uh, this year and the current uh, disturbing situation in the country, is Justice Aya Paula Bini still having presidential ambitions next year, the other years to come? You know, I often say that in Cameroon, people try to look for solutions before there are problems. How can you bring a solution to an exist, I mean, a problem that does not exist? When that time comes, we'll know. God alone knows whether I'll be there. God alone knows what you know, direction will take me to. I've already expressed to you that one of the essential would, would, things would, I think you, I should do now. Would you want to be the president of this country in the nearest future? Let us talk about the fate of the country first. Let us determine the fate of the country before anything else. Let me repeat that it appears God has a mission for me to take care of his children who are suffering, to take care of his orphans. Maybe that is more preoccupying, more beneficial to society than wanting to become president of a country like this. I, you've just forgotten, I've said already that this country is indebted for the next 200 years. How do you stay on a parcel of land for 50 years? Your parents were there, maybe your grandparents, somebody comes. The law is that you cannot obtain a land certificate until there are pillars on the ground. Somebody brandishes a piece of paper to you. And the next thing is that they bring caterpillars to pull down your, your, your house. All those the... matters will be taken to court. So Cameroon is in a, a situation now where mm -hmm. the next president, I don't know, maybe it will be like Paul Kagame to make Cameroon a country you know, worth living in.
Justice Ayapola Bini, retired Advocate General at the Supreme Court of the Republic of Cameroon, former member of the country's lower house of parliament, and of course, national president of the Popular Action Party, the PAP. Thanks for accepting to be a guest in this edition of The Insight. No, I should thank you because you've taken the bold step to interview me. I, I hear I'm not, I'm not supposed to be heard. Thank you for you know, interviewing me, taking that courage. Thanks. Thanks, ladies and gentlemen, for staying with us in this edition of the program. We'll be back at 6.30 p.m. next Sunday.